Jesus' name, thank you, God, for bringing us here to learn about you. God, we want to have a relationship with you. We want to be close to you, but there's so much about you that can be mystifying or, or odd or difficult to understand. So we ask you, Lord Jesus, tonight, through the power of your Holy Spirit, to wash us with the water of the Word tonight. Not that we would be smarter than other people, but that we would understand you more and be able to relate to you more and pray more effectively and just walk into your presence more. That's my desire. If that's your desire, just tell the Lord right now, Lord, I want to walk into your desire more. So teach me. I want to have a better relationship with you. In Jesus' name, everybody said amen. Amen. Okay, everybody, unlike me, please turn your phone to silent. Everybody's looking around wondering, whose phone just went off during first? Mine. All right, okay, so in review, we've been talking about Jesus as the Son of Man. Jesus, one of the things he called himself was the Son of Man, okay? And the um, Hebrew word for Son, anybody remember? Ben? That's right, Ben Adam. Ben Adam, Son of Man. Anybody remember the Greek for Mr. Son? Huias. Huias meaning true son. Right? Uh, anthropos. And what this shows us is this. Jesus, every time he said, I want you to look at the Son of Man. Watch me, the Son of Man. Observe me, the Son of Man. He's showing us two things. Sometimes he is showing us what you and I are capable of now. Remember Acts chapter 10 says, Jesus walked around doing all of his miracles by what? The anointing of the Holy Spirit. He did not walk in his own power, but he walked in the power of the Holy Spirit. As the Son of Man, somebody who is of human flesh, he's showing you and I what we are capable of. of. He laid hands on the sick. You and I are supposed to lay, be able to lay hands on the sick. He cast out demons. You and I are supposed to be able to cast out demons. Do you know that according to Matthew chapter 26 and Mark 16, this is not something special for a pastor. This is not something special for an evangelist. This is not something special for a priest. Actually, according to the Bible, everybody in this room is a priest. Can I hear amen? And if you wield the name and the authority of Jesus Christ, you can take authority over illness. You can take authority over demons. And you can work the kind of miracles. This is the, the, whole, the, the whole purpose of Jesus functioning as a son of man. And there were other things that he did as the Son of Man, that shows us what we will be like one day. Somebody give me an example of something he did in his glorified form that we can't do now, but we will be able to do. Float in the air. When did he do that? At the transfiguration, he's standing in the middle of the air between Elijah and Moses, right? We can't do that yet. But if Jesus did it, will we be able to do it? He ascended into heaven. We can't do that yet, but will we be able to do it? Haven't you ever thought in your head, man is supposed to be able to fly? Haven't you ever thought that? Okay, well, according to the Bible, Jesus could, you'll be able to too. What else could he do that just confounds us? He could walk on water. Will you be able to do that one day? Yes. He could walk through walls, right? Remember the apostles were meeting in the room and all of a sudden he walks through the walls and says, hey, what's up? Yeah, I mean, you know, I, if I'm in a room and suddenly somebody walks through the wall and says, peace, be still, I don't know how peaceful I would feel, but that's what Jesus was able to do. And if Jesus, as the Son of Man, is able to do that, will you and I be able to do that? Have you stopped to think of all the things that God is going to have you doing one day with all the abilities and capacities that God wants you to have? This is all stuff by His design. He wants you to have this. He wants to bless you this way. He wants to use you like this. And there are certain things that He wants you to do now and other things He wants you to do later. So, Jesus as the Son of Man is what we've been studying. And last week, we started talking about the triune nature of God and how God is three in one. Somebody tell me what God is three in one. He has three parts. He is what? Father. Okay, what else? Son, what else? Holy Spirit. Is there any other way of describing the Son? Word, yes. Son, Word, 
What's the Greek word for word? Anybody remember? Logos? Oh, by the way, do we want to do our Greek? All right, we'll do our, we'll do our Greek next week. Okay? I was going to have you do a little Greek exam, but, you know, we'll, we'll hold that off. Okay, so, Father, Son, the Word, the Holy Spirit. How do we understand this? We refer to God as the Holy Trinity. Is he three separate gods? Does he just wear different hats? Is he like the picture you saw on Facebook that I posted? There's an old man, for some reason, always howly, white hair, long flowing, you know, beard, and looks very wise, and that's God the Father. And then there's Jesus, the Son, most of the time with a beard, sometimes without, oftentimes again, almost always howly. And he has little nail prints, and he has a, sometimes his heart is showing, and sometimes it's not. And then there is a bird, a dog, symbolizing the Holy Spirit. If you were to be, if you were to die tonight and go to heaven, is that what you expect to see? Is that what the Bible describes God as? Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, is that the way he looks? Surrounded by all these little babies with wings popping out cherubs. Okay, I need to tell you that nothing in that picture is accurate. God says he is three in one. Where is the first instance where we are exposed to this concept of the triune nature, triune meaning three in one, triune nature of God? Genesis chapter one. Okay, and this is all in your study sheets. If you don't have a study sheet, please make sure you get one, okay? Because I know we're gonna cover a bit of material over the next half hour, so I wanna make sure you have this information right in front of you. Genesis chapter 1, somebody quote me the first verse in the Bible, Genesis chapter 1, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. This is the very first time we get an allusion to the fact that God is more than one. What you're about to see in Genesis chapter 1 and Genesis chapter 2 are two accounts of the creation of the universe. Okay, now this first one, in chapter 1, the word God in the Hebrew is Elohim. Say that with me. Elohim. Elohim. Yeah, that's the way it looks in Hebrew. Elohim. But Elohim, okay, now in, in chapter 2, this is chapter 1, in chapter 2, this is referred to as the Yahwistic version of creation because he is also called Elohim in the second chapter, uh, but he is all, his name appears now. And that is Yod, He, Vav, He. It looks like this. Yod, He, Vav, He. Sometimes this is called um, uh, the Tetragrammaton because it is, as you can see, three different letters. There's a Yod, there's a He, there's a Vav, and there's a He. And that's why we transliterate it Y, H, W, H. And from this, we get a variety of different things. Some people translate it as Yahweh, some people translate as Yahweh. Some people translate it as Jehovah. But all these names that are potentially the name of God all stem from this tetragrammaton collection of three letters. Now, interestingly enough, if you take a look at this, you see the first letter, Yod, the second letter, He, third letter, Vav, and fourth letter, He, again. The second and the fourth appear twice. It's almost as though God, in His name, Yahweh, in His name, Jehovah, is letting us know that in this trinity of personalities that He has, the second one, and who's the second one in the trinity again? Jesus is going to appear twice. Appears in the middle, and then appears again at the end. It's almost like you're going to see Him twice. Interesting, right? Okay, but why is this the first time we ever see evidence 
of the Trinity because the, the name or the, the name that describes God, this is translated God, is Elohim, is actually the plural version of Eloah. Eloah. Whoops. Eloah. This basically, and, and the shortened version of that is El. Okay? This means originator. Cause. This is why something would begin. And this is why we translate it El, Eloah, plural version of it, Elohim. This is what causes it. This is what starts it. Right here in Genesis chapter 1, we see that to start the entire universe as we understand it, there is a being, there is a person, there is somebody immensely powerful, incredibly effective, off-puttingly loving and caring, who wants to create a universe that blesses himself and serves him. This being is referred to as Elohim, which in the Hebrew language is the plural version of Eloah. So right here in Genesis chapter 1, it's almost as though it says, in the beginning, we who am God created the heavens and the earth. We who am God created the heavens and the earth. Now, you stop and think for a second. I don't get it. How can a single person be a we? All right. There's a number of different ways I've heard it explained. Most of them are really stupid. Okay, well, it's like the egg, you know. There's a shell and a white and a yolk, but still the whole thing is an egg. But see, here's my problem with the egg, is there is a shell, and there is a white, and there is a yolk, and you can separate them all. And that's the yolk, and that's the shell, and that's the white. And there are actually three components. There are actually three pieces. And, you know, right, we, we use the whites for certain things, right? We beat it, and we make a a certain kind of angel food cake, right, is based upon beating up egg whites, right? And egg yolks, we make uh, hollandaise, bernays, different things like that. Shells, we uh, uh, throw away. But, um, yeah, or put it in the fertilizer. But all three of them are completely separate. So I'm not a big fan of the egg analogy. I'm not a big fan of the clover leaf one. You know, well, you know, it's like a clover leaf. There's a leaf here and a leaf here and a leaf here, but the whole things are really just kind of a leaf put together. Uh, yeah, but it's just one leaf. Okay. Here's the way I see it. Imagine if I had a pitcher of water. Okay? Imagine if this pitcher right back here was full. It isn't. Splash. Just kidding. Okay. So, imagine if this was full. This is a pitcher of what, if it's full? I'm not going to fill it as an example because I know I'm going to spill it. But this is a pitcher of water. Can I refer to it as a pitcher of waters? If this is full, is there... But see, that's the thing. This is grammar now. And this is where the Hebrew is going with this Eloah Elohim. How many waters are in this water? Is it a water? Is it some water? Is it some waters? And okay, let's say I take the contents of this pitcher, just this pitcher alone. There is a certain amount of water that is in here, yes? I put it in the freezer, what happens to it? Okay, but is it the same water? But it looks completely different. It acts completely different. You can do different things with ice than you can with water. I sprain my ankle. Does it help my ankle to put water on it? No. Does it help if I put ice on it? Yes. Ice functions differently. You know, if I'm really, really angry at my son, I'm going to hit you with water. Bang. Okay, does that hurt him? What are the things that this thing was frozen and I whipped it at his head? Different, right? Okay, the whole point I'm trying to make is this. It's the same water, but it is a completely different look. And we call it two completely different things. We call this water. We call that ice. So what if I apply fire 
to the ice or the water. What happens to it? It becomes what? But it's the same water. From this picture, it's the same water. But the steam looks, again, completely different. And I do completely different things and different functions with that steam. With the water, I can... You ready for some of the stuff that I'm going to talk about in like 20 minutes? With the water, you can wash. With the steam, you can sterilize. With water, I can rinse out superficial dirt to make it look cleaner. But with steam, I can kill the germs in it and actually sterilize something. There's a difference between making something look clean and making something actually clean. One, I can do with water. And one I can do with steam. But that steam and that ice and that water is still part of this. Yes or no? So it's all part of this. Now again, the question I asked Bernie was, what I have in here, is this water or waters? Well, we want to say it's water, right? Okay. What if I take this pitcher, pour a third of it in a cup, a third of it in a pot and boil it away, and a third of it in an ice tray and freeze it? It's all from what? This one water. But now, it's three completely separate things. But is it still part of the same original? Yes. That's what we're talking about with Elohim and Eloah. It is three personalities of a single God that represents himself in three different ways. And we understand these three different ways to be Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Now, how do we know it's three? What if it's four? What if there's, it's not a trinity, it's a quadrinity, or a quintipity, or something like that? What do you think? The more the merrier, right? How do we know it's three? Father, Son, Holy Spirit, how do we, how do we know there's not more? Okay. There is no identification of the number three specifically in this word. However, again, we have in Genesis the Elohistic account. And by the way, in chapter two, we have the Yahwistic account. This is translated Lord. Okay, Elohim is translated God. Yahweh, Jehovah, is translated in English as Lord. So anytime you hear the Lord God, what two Hebrew words do you have coming up? Elohim, Jehovah. Or Elohim Yahweh. So anytime you see the Lord God, you're seeing Elohim, the creative God, the powerful God, the God who is the source and originator of it all, who is also the Lord, the one who loves, the one who nurtures, the one who cares about you, and the one who wants to see you blessed and see you redeemed. In Genesis chapter 1, verse 26, God is talking now. And he says... Let who? Weird, right, Brian? If he's just one God, he would say, I shall make. But instead here, correctly translating the Hebrew, it says, let us. God speaking to himself, saying, let us. Let us make, God, let us make man, Adam, in our image, in our likeness. And let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, fowl of the air, and so on and so forth. So God created man, Adam, in his own image. In the image of God created he, male and female created he them. So male and female both are created what? In the image and the likeness of God. What does the word image mean? You are created. Doesn't matter if you are a man or woman. Doesn't matter if we're talking about Josh or Bernie. Doesn't matter if we're talking about Brian or Ciara. CR, sorry. Doesn't matter. Male or female, older or younger, doesn't matter. You are all made in the image of God. Yes or no? Right? That's what he says. Male and female, I made them. Okay, so if that's true, how can God be a male? Why would he have to be in gender, specifically male, when he says, in my image, I made him, Adam, Male and female, Adam, meaning mankind, of course, not, of course, not just man, in his image. 
It doesn't matter if you're a woman. It doesn't matter if you're a man. You're made in the image of God. So it cannot be part of the physiognomy of a male that identifies what fulfills the description in my image and in my likeness. When the Bible says, you, Adam, are made, and it doesn't matter if you're a girl or a guy, you're still referred to as an Adam, part of mankind. You're made in my image. What does he mean? He can't mean Chinese or Hawaiian or Filipino or Haole. He can't mean tall or short. He can't even mean male or female, young or old. He's got to mean something else. So what does he mean? In what way are we in his image and likeness? The word image is se lum. Say that with me. Se lum. Se lum is an exact replica and duplicate. Like a Xerox copy. Uh, se lum is a replica that is so exact, you cannot tell one from the other. Now God says, I, in, in my image, I made you. I'm going to make you exactly like I made myself. You are going to be an exact image and an exact replica of myself. Just like Lohella. Where are my donuts, by the way? Can't we have both, like tonight and Sunday? Okay, are we having donuts on Sunday, are we? Yes. Okay, anyway. What are you looking at? You can't have donuts anyway. Brian can't have donuts. He's a vegan now, right? No? Okay. Anyway. All right. So, in his, like, in his image, we are made to be exactly like him. Like Lahela's donuts. Indistinguishable one from the other. You've seen one, you've seen them all. But it also says he, he, he made us in his image and in his likeness. Now, the word likeness is da mut. I know, it's, Hebrew is terrible. It's, it's not as bad as Chinese, but it's close. Da mut. Say that with me. Da mut. And you, you actually he, see the Hebrew words there for it. It means a miniature that is similar. Okay? For instance, how many of you guys, when you were a kid, had little toy tools? A little shovel and a little rake, and a little pick, and remember playing with those, and going out to the backyard, and taking a little pick, and picking in the ground, and taking a little shovel, and digging, and then maybe, you know, if you were like me, you took your little toy shovel, and you wanted to eat your cereal with it, you know, and you had a mother like me that said, don't eat that, that's a toy, that's not a spoon, but I'm like, to me, it's like a spoon, right, because it looks exactly the same, it's almost the same size, but that's what damut means, it is similar, it is a miniature, so we have the combination of these two things. We have God saying, I'm going to make you in my selum, in my image. I want you to function and look exactly like me in miniature. Now, years ago, I struggled with this word, damut. To come up with a way of expressing to people what damut really meant. And I finally found, found something. Years ago, how many of you guys remember years ago they, they did a restoration of the Statue of Liberty? Okay, well, and Statue of Liberty looks better because they went, <coughs> excuse me, and painstakingly shaved the copper off the surface, the, 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 the faded copper that it all turned all grungy and green. They scraped all that copper off to restore the original look of the Statue of Liberty. Here's the thing. They took... That copper shaved off of the Statue of Liberty, they cast it and they melted and they made, guess what? Little Statues of Liberty. That looked exactly like the original. That is a, say, that's a damut. A miniature version of the original actually made of components of what the original was. You need to understand who and what you are. You were originally created by God to fellowship with Him. The Jews are referred to as the, bro the wife of God. You and I, because we're saved by our knowledge and faith in Jesus Christ, can I hear an amen? amen. We're referred to as a very unique entity in the universe. We're referred to as the bride of Christ. Forevermore, throughout all of eternity, a million years from now, 
when people continue to still get created and live and get redeemed, you and I will eternally be known as a part of the bride of Christ. But either way, you and I were originally designed and created to be able to walk and talk with God and fellowship with Him, but we are supposed to be a miniature version of Him. So, why did I tell you all this? I thought we were studying God and I thought we were studying the Trinity. We're studying the Trinity in reverse. We're using the fact that He identifies Himself in us. If He says He has made us in His likeness and us in His image, then does it not logically follow that if we study the way we are made and constructed, we will know something about what He is? Yes or no? You and I are in His image. You and I are in His likeness. So if we see you and I, we, we, we study what we're like, and we try to discern in what way could we possibly be like God, we'll understand something about Him. Well, the triune nature of man is simple. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 23. Now may the God of peace Himself sanctify you entirely, and may your spirit and soul and body, say that with me, spirit, soul, and body, one more time, spirit, soul, and body, be preserved completely without blame at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. So we human beings, we Adam, we are what? Three in one. Which is why I don't quite get why the concept of the Trinity is hard for people to understand. Because we are three in one. We are triune. I have a spirit. I have a soul. I have a body. We spent much time at the beginning of the year talking about the nature of man, the nature of Adam, and how we are all three of these components, spirit, soul, and body. So if we understand ourselves to be spirit, soul, and body, why would it be so difficult to understand God triune? If you and I are triune, He is also going to be what? It is in this way that you and I are in His image. Now we refer to ourselves as spirit, soul, and body. We refer to Him in a variety of different ways, actually. We concentrate, because it's very lyrical, on Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Can I ask you a question? How many times is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit found in Scripture? How many places do you find that term, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, in the Bible? Hmm? Anyone want to take a shot at? Can anybody tell me where it's found? That's right, Matthew chapter 28, right? Baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Jesus said for us to do that. Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Okay, where else is this descriptor of the Trinity found? Want to guess? Nowhere. It's used once. Stop. If you and I are, as Christians, completed Jews, technically, believers in a God who identifies himself as Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, are we polytheists? Somebody tell me what a polytheist is. Poly. Many, theist, comes the Greek word theos, God, many gods, multiple gods. Are we polytheistic? Now, by the way, let me just say, if the Bible described us as polytheistic and told us we're supposed to be polytheistic, I don't have a problem with that. Where I have a problem is, that's not what, God, that's not what the Bible said. Because, as we see, Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 4, Repeat it with me, please, because it's right there in your notes. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is what? The Lord is one. Hear, O Israel, the Lord, our, the Lord is our God, the Lord is one. Hear, O Israel, the Lord is our God, the Lord is one. That word one is echad. One, single, not multiple. In fact, the word actually means not multiple. Okay, how many Wendell Choi's are there? Actually, I've come to find out there are, there are actually three on this island. Very confusing. 
And one of them lives down the block from my house. I live at 2318 Seaview. He lives at 2318 Medcap, which is just one block away. He's an attorney, by the way, and I'm, a, and I'm a minister, right? Do you know how many times I've gotten phone calls in the middle of the night sometimes? Hello? I'm like, hello, this is Wendell. Oh, Wendell, thank God. Oh, man, I need your help, brah. I'm like, okay, okay, that's fine. Where are you? Well, bro, I'm in prison. I'm like, okay, who's this, Koi? No, 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 I mean, I, mean, I didn't mean you. I meant another Koi. Uh, but... I'm like, wait, are you looking for the Wendell Choi, the attorney, or Wendell Choi, the pastor? I love that tone. What? Okay, there's, there's kind of two Wendell Choi's. One is an attorney, one's a pastor. Which one are you? I'm like, well, I'm the pastor. It sounds to me like you need me more than the other one. Uh, uh, that, that's funny. Uh, you got his number. I'm like, and I do, by the way. But um, how many Wendell Choi's do you see? You actually see three. You actually see four. You see Wendell Choi, the pastor. You see Wendell Choi, the husband. You see Wendell Choi, the father. You see Wendell Choi, the businessman. You see Wendell Choi, the tennis player. You see Wendell Choi, the golfer. You see Wendell Choi, the guitar player. You see Wendell Choi, the singer-songwriter. You see Wendell Choi in a whole lot. There's a whole lot of different Wendell Choi's. And as a, when I'm functioning as a singer-songwriter, I don't sound or look the same. I act completely different. When I am doing business, I don't sound as gentle as I do now. I'm, 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 I'm very exacting. However, if I'm speaking as a father, I am just as tender. Right? Yeah. yeah. But the plain fact of it is, all of us function differently. And let me push the point just a little bit further. How many of you wear a lot of different hats in life? Say amen. Wouldn't it be nice to be able to split? Wouldn't it be great if you could send Wendell the chef over there to actually learn how to cook at, you know, Boots and Chemo? Wouldn't it be great, you know, if you could send Wendell the businessman here to take care of property, Wendell the pastor to go study all day long instead of being distracted by all these stupid things. I can't do that. How many of you ladies would love for there to be a Atoll the wife that you could send in to, you know, Brian, and Atoll the mother that you could constantly watch Manning, and Atoll, you know, the house person that could actually you know, clean, and, and, and then Adel, the, you know, the, the legal aid that could you go and earn, you know, $8,000 a month, and Adel to this and Adel to that, and you can, like, split into, like, seven Adels. Brian's totally stoked with that idea. Seven of them. Wouldn't that be great? I can't do that. And much as you would like to, you can't do it. You know who can? Elohim. He has this ability. He has this ability to represent himself and manifest in three different ways. It's not that weird, frankly, it's not that unusual. And to me, I actually put this in your notes. I can't believe I did that. Confusion is kind of stupid. Okay? God can't do this. Duh. Okay. So, Matthew 28, Go ye therefore teach all nations, baptizing in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Pater, huios, and hagius, Numatos. These are the different ways that the Trinity is represented in this one case. And by the way, oh wow, I'm running out of time, so I'm going to have to almost like close with this. Um, does that mean that we are supposed to, when we baptize people in water, and by the way, if you haven't done that yet, you really should, um, baptize in water are we supposed to do it in the name of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit? Or, when Peter was standing on the steps of the temple when the Holy Spirit fell on Pentecost, right? He tells them about Jesus. They're all cut to the quick, it says. And they say, brothers, now what, what must we do? And he says, <clears throat> and repent and let each one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ 
for the forgiveness of your sins. And you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. We're supposed to be baptized how? In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. So question, if in Matthew 28 it says, Jesus tells us, make disciples of all nations, baptizing in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. But this, Peter is talking to them and says, you know, what must you do to be saved? You know, repent of your sins and be baptized in the name of Jesus and then receive the Holy Spirit. So how are we supposed to baptize? Believe it or not, there are denominations out there that are crazy enough to make a whole burgeoning, massive doctrine about this one point. Okay, all you have to understand is this. In the name of Jesus is just a Greek way of saying by the authority of Jesus. That's it. It doesn't mean that you pedantically have to speak the words, I baptize you in the name of Jesus only. Now, you think I'm crazy, okay? But there, is, there are denominations out there that do this very thing. And, Kayla, Baros, we take you and we baptize you in the name of Jesus only. And pull you out. Because it's a sin to say, baptize you in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, because this scripture says we're supposed to be baptized in the name of Jesus, paren, only. Is that what that's saying? Okay. The phrase, in Jesus' name, just means by his authority. That's it. It's like somebody shouting, stop in the name of the law. Or, 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 or you know, Joshua texting Matthew and saying, uh, Matt, you know, Pastor Wendell asks you to, you know, get rice before you come. Well, then you move heaven and earth, you know, to get the rice because not... You know, Joshua Choi is not asked, but, you know, this, this icon, Shylock figure, this bigger-than-life personality, persona has requested of you, a mere mortal, to do this. Maybe not. But still, okay, it's, that, that's what it means. It means in his authority. So it says, when he says, baptize in the name of Jesus, he means to say exactly what Jesus said. Baptize you in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen? And that's doing it in Jesus' name because that's doing it by His authority. Okay, anyway, let's go on. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are the words that we see given to us by Jesus in Matthew 28. But, in 1 John chapter 5, verse 7 and 8, we get two extremely quizzical verses. Now, this 1 John chapter 5, verse 7, some people say, is only found in the King James Bible. Well, in English, yes. And what they want you to think is, using these terms, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, is only found in very ancient, odd, you know, Greek text. Not so, by the way. There are two editions of the Textus Receptus and also one from the Greek Orthodox Church that all use the complete Greek that says, for there are three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Spirit. The Father, the Word, the Logos, and the Holy Spirit. There are three that bear witness in heaven. The Father, the Word, who is also the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Then, it goes on to say in 1 John chapter 5, verse 8, and these are three that bear witness on earth, the Spirit, the water, and the blood. So, Jesus says there's three. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And we've discerned that in order for us to be made in the image and likeness of God, because we are triune, He must be triune. So we're going to look for the three representations of God to fulfill our understanding of who and what He is. Jesus says He's Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. 1 John chapter 5, verse 7 says He's Father, the Word, and the Holy Spirit. And here in 1 John chapter 5, verse 8... It says that there's one representation of the Father, the Word, and the Holy Spirit in heaven. 
but another representation of these three on earth. Spirit, water, and blood. God the Trinity, God who represents himself as three in one, functions one way in heaven and functions one way on earth. And coming to understand the application of 1 John 5, verse 7, and 1 John chapter 5, verse 8, will help us understand how the Trinity functions in heaven and how did the Trinity functions on earth why is this important who gives a rest God is three in one Father, Son, and Holy Spirit Father, Word, and the Holy Spirit functions as spirit, water, and blood why do we want to understand this what's the point can't we just say oh God this oh God that well therein lies the rub right the Bible says we're supposed to have fellowship with the Holy Spirit amen the Bible says we're supposed to pray to our Father directly in Jesus' name. Amen? The Bible says we're supposed to have fellowship with our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen? Who do you pray to? How do you word your prayer? How does God function? When do you come to Wendell, the pastor? When do you come to Wendell, the businessman? When do you come to Wendell, the musician? When would you access different parts of my personality and who I am? When would I come to talk to Matt, the Vice President of House of Finance, to go ask for uh, uh, a restructuring of my loan? When would I come to and Jojo Risco and ask about life insurance? Or when would I talk to Jojo about being a drummer? See, there's all these different aspects of the relationship. Well, when it comes to God, I have heard people get so tripped up and confused. So, am I supposed to talk to the Father now? Am I supposed to talk to Jesus now? Am I supposed to share this with the Holy Spirit now? Uh, 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 what, does he, what is He supposed to do? What is He supposed to do? Aren't they all supposed to be doing the same thing? Well, no, actually, now we find out from 1 John chapter 5, verse 8, that they have different functions on earth and serve different functions in heaven. What do they do? That's what we're going to talk about next week. Okay? Well, you don't want to sit here until like 9 p.m., right? Don't you have like pre-Super Bowl stuff you want to watch? Okay, for tonight, here's what I want you to understand. God is three in one. He functions in three different ways. We are not polytheists. We're monotheists. We believe in one God, but that one God we understand to manifest in three different ways. Okay? And the reason you and I are the way we are, spirit, soul, and body, is because God originally designed us to be like Him, to function like Him, to have a relationship with Him. You have, just based on what we heard tonight, no idea what God has planned for you in, in glory. Because I think it's very, very difficult for you or I to relate to what we truly are. You just see this. But you and I are so much more. And in studying the Trinity, we're going to understand how much more we are. Amen? Father, in Jesus' name, God, we come before you. You are an awesome God. You created us to be like you. And I want to learn more about you. I want to learn more about the Father, Son, Holy Spirit, the Father, Word, and Holy Spirit. The Spirit, the water, and the blood. Because I want to know what you've created me to be. And I want to know how to relate to you better. So tonight, I understand and I just profess with faith, you are my God. You are my Lord. You are three different personalities in one, and that's fine with me. I give you praise for your glory. I thank you that you can appear and manifest in three different ways, but it's all the same person, all the same God. You are glorious, you are wonderful, you are awesome, and I give you praise in Jesus' name. Everybody said amen. Let's sing it together. Praise the name of Jesus. Let's all stand. Praise the name of 
Jesus is our rock, is our fortress, is our deliverer, in him will we trust. Praise the name of Jesus. Everybody said amen. Thank you for coming tonight. God bless you guys. There's more food there, by the way. Do we have more pies? I want one.